Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, as I've just been introduced, I'm Daniel Betts. I am the founder of Hummingbird Resources. I founded the company in 2006, and my ambition at the time was to go to explore the unexplored eastern part of Liberia that had never been explored for gold before. Um, I set out to the jungle, and we had some exploration success. <coughs> and um, in 2010, we listed the company on, on AIM in London. At the time, we raised $40 million, and the intention at the time was to spend that money uh, exploring for gold in Liberia. Over the following two years, we were the most successful gold exploration company in West Africa. We um, added 4.2 million ounces of gold at a cost of $5 an ounce to our gold infantry. But what I had missed in hindsight was a spectacular timing with the downturn in the junior mining industry. So that success was met with the junior mining market being severely hammered all around the world. And I was left with um, some serious thinking to do. We had a very big project with a, a $250 million capital build number. And I was left thinking, this is going to be very difficult to fund in a market that is losing its um, appetite for gold. So we could either try and wait out the market, which history has proved is a dangerous thing to do, or we could try to come up with a new strategy. And that strategy was to find a, a lower cost, um, higher grade gold mine that we could bring into construction quickly to take Hummingbird into cash flow and then exploit what we saw as a downturn in the market and um, take advantage of the situation rather than let events dictate themselves to us. We acquired a project last year and that's the project that I want to talk to you about later today. But to give you a little bit of background about Hummingbird first, um, the total inventory now stands at 6 million ounces of gold and we have 5,000 square kilometers of exploration under our, under our um, under our company. This is split into two, two projects, the project in Liberia and the project in uh, Mali, which we bought last year. The Yamfalila Gold Project in Mali, uh, we are looking to do first gold pour in H1 next year, and it will target 100,000 ounces of gold produced in year one. When we bought the project, we were anticipating um, 55,000 ounces of gold a year over the life of mine, with 75,000 ounces in the first year. So you can see our current projections are significantly better than what we thought when we bought the project last year. The, the, the cash cost of $641 an ounce uh, is in the lowest quartile for the region, and that's one of the reasons that attracted us to the project. It's very shallow, um, soft oxide material, which means we can process it cheaply. And when we bought the project, most importantly of all, we, um, we announced a funding package with a lender out of Australia called Taurus Funds Management that would allow us to um, reconfigure the project and build the project to, gold, to first gold pool. So Hummingbird is a rare beast in the junior, junior gold market, being that it is a funded company to production and cash flow. Um, the company has also got a highly experienced board to, you know, with a lot of grey hair for me to lean on and guide me through the process of building a gold company. And I can come back onto that uh, in, a, in a little bit. The market cap of the company is approximately $50 million. To put that in perspective, if we produce 100,000 ounces in the first year, which will start from next year, that will give the company free cash of approximately $50 million. So effectively, we will be making our market cap back in free cash from year one, which is a pretty unusual proposition. And that's before we get on to upside through the gold price and market cycles and all the rest of it. Um, we have a very strong institutional shareholder base, and we've had that since IPO. Not only are they institutional, but they're also in the likes of RCF, Sprott, and Dundee, um, highly technical, and uh, their due diligence process has been extremely thorough. Our biggest shareholder is Goldfields. The reason for that is that Goldfields was the major gold mining company who we acquired the project from, and they took stock in Hummingbird for the acquisition, which was $20 million of, of Hummingbird paper. I think that in itself is, is a, a huge point because for there were 35 companies that, that, that bid for the Yamfalilla asset from Goldfields and they chose to take Hummingbird's paper offer, which shows support for Hummingbird's ability to deliver the project and also their belief in the leverage they get to the upside in Hummingbird's stock price once we deliver the project. Um, yeah. 
And as I said, Hummingbird has a $75 million funding package with Taurus. We also have $8 million of cash in the bank, and we also have a $5 million equity work program with one of the contract miners in West Africa called BCM. So um, what that means is a lot of the work we're doing at the moment, the, the pre-construction work and earthworks that have already commenced, which I can show you shortly, are being funded through equity, not cash. So it helps us preserve our cash and make sure that we won't trip up in the process of building the project. Before I get into the detail of Jan Falilla, I'd just like to take a little step back and um, talk about markets and cycles. The mining sector is notoriously, as with all resources, a hugely cyclical sector. It comes and goes, and if you look at the last 50 years, it's, it's, it's the most cyclical business there is. I didn't realize it at the time, but when we listed Hummingbird in 2010, we rang the bell at the top of the market. And the last five years has been pretty dire for investors and companies operating in that space. Investment has been constrained, ability to execute projects has been constrained, and as a result, companies are really struggling. This chart clearly shows that the mining sector has been the worst performing sector of the last five years. Um, what I'd say is, you know, I don't know where the bottom is, nobody does, but what is clearly evident is it's not the top. And if history's taught us anything, you know, you want to be finding a time to invest when there's upside in the macro situation. Um, Another cycle that we should bear in mind is the mining industry cycle itself. This is data put together by a consortium of majors spearheaded by Goldcorp. What it shows is that it takes 20 years from grassroots discovery to production. And as you can see, we are now experiencing peak gold production from the exploration success in terms of ounces found and money spent of 20 years ago. If you can see, I think I've got a laser here. If you look after this, both the discoveries and the spend in exploration fell off hugely. And what that will translate to is a predicted sharp downturn in gold being produced over the next 10 years. Um, I think that this is a very significant point because Hummingbird will be aiming to start production into this downturn in global supply. Now, I know the gold price relies on a lot more than supply and demand, a lot more than most commodities, but it is a factor. And there is no doubt that building into a downturn in supply is going to be an advantage for gold companies, and very few are able to do it. The challenge for the gold industry over the next 10 years is going to be how do the majors and how do the mid-tier producers uh, fill up the, the production that they need to meet their forecasts. And it's not going to come from organic growth. So it's going to come from M&A, and I think that means that you're going to see an awful lot of activity in the junior space where there are quality assets that majors can buy um, for, for very good, good value. And from our point of view as a, as a company, do we want to sit there and, and be acquired because people only acquire you when they think you're good value, or do you want to exploit this market and grow a gold company? And at Hummingbird, we're young enough and ambitious enough to try and see this as an opportunity to grow a gold company. This is the third cycle I want to bring your sector to, uh, your attention to, which is within the mining sector itself, the junior gold sector, which is the green line, and exactly mirrors Hummingbird, is the worst performing of all. Uh, senior gold has performed slightly better. The reason for that is pretty obvious. Gold, junior gold companies have less cash. They're normally single asset companies, and those assets are further away from production than majors, so they carry the most risk. But what I would argue is that with risk, comes reward. And if you can find junior companies that are funded, that have real projects that will get to execution and produce cash flow, then you're going to see the most leveraged upside in those stocks. Um, you can also see here a massive divergence in the, the gold price decline and the depression in the, in the gold mining sector. So basically what it's saying is your investment's more leveraged into the stock than it is into the gold because a lot of them will fail. So the challenge is to pick the ones that won't. Um, our strategy, as, I, as I've said, is to exploit this current perfect storm of, of a downturn in the markets and build a project while nobody else is. And then after we've built that project and we've insulated ourselves from those markets, use that cash flow to exploit it and acquire other undervalued assets. In order to do that, over the last nine months since we acquired the Jan Falilla project, a lot of my time has been on building a team. Hummingbird's team prior to the acquisition was largely exploration skills and exploration geologists. 
and I've had to totally build a team with the ability to develop and run a gold mine, which is really a whole new business to exploration. Um, I'm very proud, really, of the people that we've managed to attract to Hummingbird. I think it's a function of the, the depressed market at the moment that a junior can attract the skills we have, but it's also a testament to their belief in the project and also Hummingbird's energy. I'd like to draw particular attention to Marcel Damon, who was the mine manager at Rangold, um, and then he became their group mine manager. So for a man of Marcel's caliber to join a single asset development company in, in Yanfalilla is, is quite a coup. Not only that, of course, he, he's lived in Mali for many years and has done this several times with Rangold. Through Marcel, we've also managed to attract um, geotechnical expertise and mine scheduling expertise that within in the Rangold group. And at MTB Project Management there, what I haven't spelled out is the leader of that company is a man called Dale Bube, who was head of Newmont's project developments and has built many gold mines in his life. And he is the overall project uh, director living on site, managing all the costs and bringing this project to fruition day to day. In Ian, Mike and, and Mark, I've got some wise grey hair and deep technical skills to lean on through all the stages of the, the geological cycle. And um, I think they're extremely high caliber people. I mean, Mark himself built Perseus in West Africa and Ian was the chief executive of, of Goldfields and formerly of Hummingbird as well till last year. So that brings us on to Jan Falella. And this is a photo taken two days ago of the um, earthworks going on at Jan Falella at the moment, which will enable us to uh, carry on construction through the coming wet season. I think this slide is, is a bit of a shock to a lot of people that don't realize how advanced the project is and how fast we're progressing. Um, this is really happening and it's happening right now. So a little bit about the project itself. Um, the project will produce gold at an all-in cash cost of $733 an ounce for the life of mine, which gives us a free cash margin today. Gold price has gone up, so I can say this, $500 an ounce. Um, this, will, this will be in the lowest cost quartile of, of gold producers in West Africa. What I'd also like to add is that in the first two years, where we are driving grade forward and cash forward to pay back Taurus's debt quicker, the cash costs will be considerably lower. As I've mentioned before, we're targeting in the, in the um, optimization study we announced a month ago, 100,000 ounces of gold in the first year, uh, and that will give the project an RR of 35%. We have a $75 million debt facility, and we've started. What I'd also like to say, though, is that I think there's considerable upside still to come from this project, and I'll come on to that um, in a couple of slides. But first of all, I'd like to talk to you about the, the speed that Hummingbird has delivered at since we acquired the project in July last year. Goldfields had spent $140 million on this project. They were trying to build a project that was big enough for a major to produce 200,000 ounces a year. They, they, they put 400,000 meters of drilling into these resources, but ultimately the resources weren't big enough to support the scale of operation they wanted. And with the gold price going down, they decided to put it up for sale. Uh, they, they agreed with our strategy that within that resource, there was a higher grade, smaller component, which is shaded in here, which is just the near surface oxide material, which was shallow, free milling, good gravity recovery, and, and cheaper, apart from anything else, to build the plant and to process. It wouldn't move the needle for a company like Goldfields, but it's a perfect project for a company like Hummingbird and our strategy of, of growing into this downturn. Our first objective was to infill drill the oxide resources, which Goldfields have been focusing on the deeper ounces, to prove that they would um, be robust enough to support the mine plan. And whilst we did that, we increased the resource by almost 50% to 620,000 ounces in that oxide component only. That allowed us to become more aggressive with our plan. And with our engineers in South Africa, we decided to build a slightly bigger plant, allowing us to process more ore. We also built in the capacity to process 50% uh, fresh rock blended with that oxide material. And we'll bring in extra power and crushing capability as the mine develops. The reason we did that is because unlike most companies that say, oh look, there's loads of potential, there's lots of exploration upside, we've got it, it's here. It's already in resources. We've got a million ounces of gold. That most of it is in the indicated category, sitting there in proven deposits next to the mine plant. So we need to focus our, our project on um, the robust oxide component, paying back Taurus and getting into cash flow quickly. 
but then we don't want to trip ourselves up by not being able to expand into the resources that are already there. Um, as you can see here, in the current mine plan, the, the gold produced in the life of mine has also increased by 50% since we, increased, since we bought the project, um, not even a year ago. But on top of that, um, I want to point out some of the upsides from here. These two pits, Kamana West and Kamana East, are the two drivers of, of the deposit. Um, but these other uh, deposits in red are existing deposits where we have resources. The blue are extensions where we believe we can add to those extorsors. So we think within the resource itself, there's a lot of upside. The other thing is in, the, in these uh, deposits that have become mines in Mali, what you see in the resource near surface is there's a lot of high grade material, but when you're putting your resource plan together, you don't include it because you, you apply what's called a top gut to, pr to provide a conservative estimate of the re resource so that your lenders know they're going to get their money back. But in reality, if some of those high grade zones stick together, the amount of gold that is going to come through the plant in the first two years is going to be significantly more. So we are hopeful that there's going to be significant resource upside from where we are now. But the most important upside for me is the geotechnical side of it. And what this means is the geotech is where you, um, you, due to the competence of the rock, you manage how steep your pit walls can be. And based on Goldfield's work, we have used extremely shallow pit walls. So actually at 32 degrees, which is it's the same uh, steepness as a pile of sugar. If you pour a pile of sugar out on your table, that's how steep our pit walls are, which is ridiculous. But we needed to build a model that was conservative enough for everyone to be satisfied we weren't taking chances shortcuts and the numbers are still impressive. We've taken on this Rangold geotechnical expert. He thinks he can steepen the pit walls by 10 degrees. What this would mean is the amount of waste we have to mine is reduced by a significant amount and we can drive the pits deeper into the gold we know is there, produce more gold, reduce the costs. And we're doing this work at the moment and hopefully um, we'll be able to announce some positive results from that shortly. Uh, again, with the, the guys we've taken on from Rangold, we're re-looking at the multi-pit scheduling where we can stockpile ore and hopefully bring grade and cash forward. And we'll constantly look to challenge every operational and, and capex cost, and I believe we'll make, make savings there. This is just a brief slide showing the different pits and where the ore comes from in the schedule. As you can see, the green and blue are the two I said are the, the main drivers, where 80% of our focus is, because they're the guts of the operation at the moment. And as you see, this project will generate $200 million of free cash um, on the schedule we have at the moment before including any of the upside or any of the exploration potential. And if I go back, in this belt, which is all in our mining license and where Goldfield spent $140 million, it's one of the biggest geological databases most of our ge geologists have ever seen and we haven't even started looking at that data yet. Um, so in conclusion, I think the speed of Hummingbird's development from acquisition has been extraordinary, really, in this market. To acquire the asset, to secure the debt facility with Taurus, to re-optimise the study from a 3 million tonne plant that Goldfields had to our 1 million tonne plant, complete the engineering, um, order all the mills, and start Earthworks on the project with an aim to being in first gold pool within two years from acquisition is highly unusual in the market. And then on top of that, rather than saying there is future upside, we already have a four and a half million ounce project in Liberia that gives you, in the current price, the most unbelievably leveraged option on the gold price. So I think, um, in conclusion, I think the stars are perfectly aligned in terms of the junior market space um, and the gold price and the expiration uh, and discovery cycle within the mining space to get into the gold sector. I think everyone's been depressed for so long that you know it's got to turn. The challenge is finding juniors that um, will deliver, have the team to deliver, the cash to deliver, and the resources to deliver. And I believe Hummingbird has the full house in that regard. So we're very excited about the next two or three years and think it's a huge opportunity. Thanks very much for your time. <clears throat> Um, do you have any questions for Daniel, please? Gentleman here? Can you wait for the microphone? Thank you. 
Hi there, thank you for your talk. Uh, just wanted to ask, uh, as part of your company, as a gold, is it gold producing or a gold extraction? Call it. Uh, the aim is to be a gold mining company. Producing gold mining. Gold. We're developing at the moment. Okay, I just want to ask: when it comes to like after all this so um, much um, mining, um, when it comes to transporting, do you really get involved? To the bank, uh, bank of the museum, and I've seen the size of a gold bar. Do you go when it comes to helping with the market currency? Or do you just ha uh, go through with uh, retail services like jewelries and all that? Well, is there a difference between the gold bar and the gold and ret retail gold? Yes, yeah, so, so basically the way it works at a mine is you produce what's called Dore, 98% gold bars, probably 20 kilos in size. And every week or month, or depending on your insurance and logistics, it, you ship them out to a refinery, so in Dubai or South Africa. As it happens, our family business is the oldest gold refining smelting business in the UK in Birmingham. Uh, and we have a lot of expertise in refining, recycling and supplying that metal to the jewellery industry. So it's an area where I will look to get involved because we have a lot of skills and I don't want them to rip us off. We go to all this work to produce the gold and all this, you know, I want to be on top of it. Um, any, any other questions? Gentlemen down here, please. Wait, okay, wait for the microphone, please. Thank you. <coughs> How sensitive is your future plans to the price of gold? If gold drops significantly, it, are your borrowings going to cause a major problem? Potentially. I mean, it's, a, it's an excellent question. I mean, I think um, this, this project, as I said, is in the lowest quartile in terms of cash cost. So at $1,000 gold, 25% so drop, give or take, from today, all the covenants with our debt still works and you're still producing $25 million free cash a year. So I think we're in the bottom quartile, but I think any investor should be totally um, aware of the risk of the gold price. It's, it's a crazy industry. You spend hundreds of millions of dollars. The skills are amazing. The workload is extraordinary. And then it comes down to bet on the gold price. If, if gold goes to $800 an ounce, this project won't pay back its debt. But there will be 90% of the gold companies in the world will have gone bust first. I mean, that, you know, that was what attracted us to this project, was that it was a cheap um, extraction and it was a cheap build. So the amount of debt to borrow is not uh, exorbitant. Daniel, uh, before we have the next question, your personal view on gold price, everyone's got a view. Um, do you ten, think at the moment... $10,000. $10,000. Yeah, ten <laughs> <laughs> Over the next two to three years, we won't hold you to it, but what, 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 what's your personal view? My, my personal view over a five-year view is that it has to go up. I mean, all this money printing in the USA and in Europe can't not come home to roost at some point. But there are some very, very clever people playing some very clever games, and it can certainly uh, stay around where it is for a while longer than, than I would like. I mean, what the saying is the market can remain illogical for longer than you can remain solvent, I think. And I think it's the same with the gold price. I mean... I would, I'd never put a price target on it because anyone that does is always always wrong. Question here, please. Yeah, thanks. Very interesting presentation. I had a, two questions. One was, um, what are the main challenges or risks to getting to production next year? And the other one was, it wasn't very clear what the production or the current gold production on the Liberia uh, mine was on. So, so the first question, biggest challenge to getting into production in Mali. Um, I think that the biggest risk is, is the gold price. Because if the gold price was to crash, um, you'd start getting into issues with your lenders, you'd start getting twitchy, and then you wouldn't meet drawdowns during the construction phase. So I think that is the biggest risk. I mean, I, I look at these projects, you have political risk, technical risk, the resource, which is the most important thing, operational risk, can you deliver it, and financial risk. And I believe the first three we've eliminated on this project. So the one left to manage is financial risk. Um, and we've managed it better than anybody else in the sector because we've secured the money. The second question with regards to Liberia. Um, Liberia, at the moment, we're doing a hydropower study with, funded by the, the World Bank and the IFC. And the purpose of that is to bring the operating cost, which is 44% of, of the cost per ounce, down. Um, and because we're focused on building this project, it gives us time. So I would like to think that we look to start building that project when we end, this, end the build on this project, move the team over, start of next year. But I mean, um, I think having that cash flow and proven ability to build a mine will put Hummingbird in a much stronger position to be believed that we can build a, a three and a half million tonne a year operation in, in Liberia, which is a bigger challenge. 
But I mean, it's, the, the point about Liberia for me is key. I mean, I, I think the market sees it as a yoke around hummingbird's neck. Oh, you've got this big asset. How are you going to develop it? It doesn't cost us very much at all to keep the license in good standing and to, and to re, re, improve the, the studies we've done. But the exposure to the, uh, the economics of a, a rising market and the fact we've got four and a half million ounces of gold already is, is huge. A question here, please. Could you say a bit about the attitudes of the Malian government and the Liberian government uh, to, to mining in general in, in their countries? Uh. Um, whatever I say now, one's going to sound worse than the other, so I hope it doesn't get fed back to them. But uh, I, I have found the Malian government, since we entered the country in June last year, unbelievable. They're professional, they're educated, 20% they, of their GDP comes from the gold mining sector. The big mines around gold own are slowing down and Anglo's gold, so they've got these skilled people they need to put into work. They are, there's only um, Yamfalilla and potentially Papillon's project, they sold to B2, I've forgotten the name of it, but there's only potentially two new major mines coming on street in Mali. The minister is well-educated, he's young, he's energetic, <coughs> absolutely fantastic, can't fault it. In Liberia, I have a, a sweet spot in my heart for Liberia, having been there for so long, but they're challenged. And they're challenged because they don't understand mining. You know, there's one mine about to come on stream in Liberia at the moment, which Aureus are building. Um, and other than that, they have no gold mining expertise or history in their country. So all their licenses, all their mineral development agreements, they're all based on the iron ore industry. And it's been a, an educational process to teach them about how that works. And I know that sounds patronizing. It's been an education for me as well, but it, it's definitely been more challenging. That said, the intent is definitely there. They need the natural resource sector to, to redevelop the country. And they see it as hugely important. Any other questions? Um, gentleman over here, Chris. Are there any other significant materials there? Significant materials? In, in what you're bringing out, are you finding anything else? No, both deposits in both Mali and the Yamfalilla are gold. They're just right. gold-hosted deposits. There's no uh, silver credit. There's no, just okay. pure gold. And what would you expect to end up paying for refining? Sorry? What would you expect to end up paying percentage-wise for refining? I think it's 0.2% in, in, that we have a quote for. Right, okay. Yeah. I, I had a couple of questions on the financials, please. Um, you showed you had the 75 million debt facility from Taurus and 8 million cash um, dollar at the moment. Yeah. Is that enough, to, you said, to get to production? That covers everything from what you understand at the moment um, for your models, for the, for the plans? You're, you're, you're at production with that money? Absolutely. And we also have, in addition to that, effectively a $5 million credit line from the Civil Works contract mining company in, in West Africa. So they're, they, they're taking stock in lieu of work. Um, and again, it might sound, uh, forgive me if I've misunderstood in your presentation slightly. Um, in terms of the production facilities, you're re-engineering what's already in place. Is that right? Or are you building an entirely new um, there, there, production there, process? There, no, there's nothing in place. Right. Uh, Goldfields had planned and right. done the engineering studies okay. yeah. to build a three million tonne a year plant. So we, have, we are building a one million tonne a year plant. So the work we've been doing, other than on the, the resource work, has been to engineer and design and build a one million tonne a year plant. Right. And it's a different plant because it doesn't have the, the crushing need because the, rock, the oxide material we're processing is softer. Okay, so you, some of their plans you can use, but you're modifying it for your... Absolutely, and, and that's one of the reasons we've been able to do it so quickly. And with the, when you get into production, the money that you're generating, how much of that has to go back in the first couple of years to Taurus? And how much of that do you get to use for other investment opportunities or for, the, for any other projects you've got? Well, the terms of the agreement with Taurus is that, is that we have two and a half years from final draw to repay. So actually, you'd have a, a holiday of 18 months before you need to repay Taurus their debt. So in theory, we'd have a lot of cash for the company's use. But my view would be to pay it back as quickly as possible. I mean... Uh, you know, I always grew, grew up being taught debt's a bad thing, so the quicker I can pay it off, the better. And so then for, for new opportunities, and the reason I'm asking you, you're talking about maybe buying opportunities, Absolutely, whether that be yeah. other juniors or projects from majors that they're not interested in for whatever reason. Will you have the money to go and do that, or is the money going to be going off to, to pay down the debt, or are we going to try and balance both at the same well, time? Well, I think, I think it's a case of balancing both at the same time. I mean, strategically, 
I want to be available to take advantage of the market. And the way our deal with Taurus is structured is we do have that flexibility in the repayment schedule. So if an opportunity presents itself that is too good to miss, we don't need to miss it. But that will be a discussion at the time with the board, which is going to be more advantageous to Hummingbird shareholders, pay back this debt or, or acquire this asset. And um, you know, that's something that we can only answer as and when we're in that situation. But we've built the flexibility in. Um, and final one for me, in case there's, there's any, any from anyone else. Do you foresee um, there being more opportunities in further acquisition or development of the Liberian asset? When, when, when you're at the stage of being cash generative, do you think it's more likely you're going to see other things that are more likely to be more immediately realisable? Or would you try and, again, balance and do both at the same time? It's a, it's a really difficult question because I, I don't know what opportunities may come up. Um, so I think, I think we have to just wait and see what, what presents itself. Okay. Are you staying around for a drink afterwards? Yeah. Okay. If you have any further questions, please ask Daniel later. Thank you very much indeed, Daniel. Thanks for your excellence. Much.